With proper debate and careful revision, a history may yet emerge that has implications for race relations in the present day. But like it is as compiled conversations that we've had over the years with historians and educators Detroit, who take issue not only with the historical treatment of Columbus, but the traditional interpretations of history itself. And we plan to expand this discussion in future programs. However, we begin today not with the intention to inflame, but to inform. Enslaved the very people who had befriended them. They needed a rationale. And they got that rationale from the church, uh, the papal bull of 1455, when the pope said that you're both authorized to reduce to servitude all infidel, all infidel people. The organization of the slave trade, the attitude that was to go into the slave trade was fashioned right by, by the church uh, uh, itself. The argument was between Spain and Portugal, the two nations closest to um, to Africa. And one of the main reasons why Spain and Portugal had so much anger for the Africans and so little mercy and sensitivity is that Spain and Portugal had been dominated by the Africans for nearly 800 years. Christopher Columbus, one of my favorite anti-heroes of, of history, one of the great fakes of all times, you know, a man in utter fraud who discovered absolutely nothing. But Christopher Columbus said, as man and boy, I sail up and down the Guinea coast for 23 years. Now, mangling with African sailors, he learned that there was a world out there, and he learned how, from African sailors, how to come to the so-called new world. When he arrived in the New World, he found Africans doing business with the Indians and minted corn. Christopher Columbus knew he discovered absolutely nothing. And the whole world has made our, uh, a hero out of this fake. And among the Western heroes, I don't know a bigger fake than Christopher Columbus, who welched on his debts and who enslaved the very people who had befriended him, fed his crew, cleaned his ships, showed them how to make hammocks so they can swing in the breeze other than lay on these filthy floors, that it was Christopher Columbus, after the wholesale destruction of um, the Indians, who suggested the enslavement of the Africans. So he went to Father Bartholomew de las Casas, who went to Rome and made it official. Now, he was on the island of Hispaniola, now Haiti and Santo Domingo. Christopher Columbus's brother, uh, became the governor of the island. He reduced the population from one million to six, um, to 60,000 in less than 10 years. Father Bartholomew de las Casas said that when they arrived in the West Indies, from, there were from, from 12 to 25 million people. Now, that's some, and they were all practically killed. Because the caveman experience in the ice that they talk about, dark caves, bite prison, and talk about in Iceman Inheritance, the rape and ram it of, of the, how does he say it? Why has the white man or the white race ramaged through the world, killing and conquering? We have to begin to ask us those questions because, and interesting enough, I put the book on top of Christopher Columbus. Because in our school systems and in white culture, we are trained and taught to worship this principle of death and destruction. And one of the prime examples is Christopher Columbus. And we are now going to go through, in the next couple of years, a celebration of the murder and monstrosity that Christopher Columbus represented and brought in his wake. We as African peoples and our cousins, the people of the sun, Asian, Southern Asian, and Native Americans, meaning the Mesoamericans or the Latinos, we have an obligation not to pay homage to someone who raped and pillaged our peoples. We have to raise that truth of who and what Columbus was. And in his wake came the other conquistadors, Pizarro and Cortez, that raped and pillaged the Aztecs and the Incas. And in his wake came other conquistadors, the tulip growing, windshield pushing, <laughs> wood shoe wearing Dutch that came up the Hudson River and met the Native Americans. And the Native Americans greeted the Dutch with the Sun People's Hand of Christian Fellowship. And the first thing the Dutch looked at was to see whether there was any gold on the fingers. 
to see if there was any gold on the arm. And then they went past the arm to see if there was any gold around the neck. But since there wasn't any gold, they still grabbed the hand, cut it off, and then took the Native American's land, and then start searching for gold. In other words, the value system, the conflict of the value system of the ice and the value system of the sun was what was happening when the Dutch came up the Hudson River. And what has been the synthesis? The genocide of the Native Americans and the building of white America on these lands. What is your role going to be come 1992 when the celebrations ensue uh, for Mr. Columbus? I think that I would like very much to discourage many third world countries in Africa, in South America, here on this continent from participating in a celebration if that celebration is really a celebration of the European conquest of great Spanish and Portuguese victories. Do you admire Mr. Columbus? Columbus can only be admired in terms of his determination, but he was extremely dishonest person. There are concrete examples of this because he, for example, called the Caribbean the Gulf of the Ganges. He went to find India and he insisted in calling it Inja. That is why the natives are called Injuns even to this day. He started naming places that were named by Marco Polo. And he threatened his men. He sent his notary, Fernando Pires de Luna, among the ships and made every man sign a document that he was off the continent of Asia. And he threatened his men. If there were officers, if they were later to say they hadn't come to Asia, they would be fined 500 Maravedis. And if they were common sailors, they would be given 100 lashes and have their tongues cut out. This came out in an enormous three-volume piece by John Boyd Thatcher. At the beginning of this century, it was published right here in, in America. It was drawn from all the documents of Columbus from several European languages. This man has been canonized. He was actually arrested. The Spanish had Columbus arrested by Bobadilla. On his fourth voyage, he was taken back like a black. He and his brother Bartholomew were taken back like blacks. Why? Because they found they were cheating about the discoveries that they were, A, there were some parts they were not telling the Spanish about, and that they were, they were having things with the Portuguese. They were having deals with the Portuguese. Both he and his brother were married to Portuguese women. They were having deals with the Portuguese unknown to the Spanish. When the Spanish sent him with six ships, three to go on the normal route, three to come to South America because they became aware that there was a landmass in the south. Columbus deliberately did not come off that ship when his ships landed in South America. He sent a landing party board and reported that South America was an island and that Cuba was the continent. So as to allow the Portuguese first to send Vespucci, his friend, into this area. That's why the Portuguese could claim Brazil, which is almost as large in territory as the United States. These things came out at his trial. Were it not for his great presence and his eloquence and the fact that some people say Isabella had a special liking for Columbus, he would have lost everything. And this issue is very serious because the last of Columbus's descendants was murdered, I think, about a year ago. There is, there is strong feeling in the world still about this, and yet people go about calmly after. Columbus took half a dozen Native Americans as slaves back to Europe. He presented them at the Portuguese court at the end of his first voyage, and yet he's, he's canonized. He, he opened the new world. Opened the new world for whom? Europe was able to increase, double its food supply in 30 years as a result of the foods that it got out of America and increased its, its wealth a thousandfold, fueling the Industrial Revolution. It increased its wealth a thousandfold by what it got out of Africa. We do not say this with any kind of bitterness, but we say this because we, f we feel it is necessary that these things should be corrected in order that our vision of the world can be a more total and more equalized vision so that we do not get these assumptions about Africans and Native Americans being saved and lifted up by 
foreign um, explorers. Our way into, um, into Ghana, into what became Ghana. That's King Asa's famous speech discouraging the Portuguese from, uh, from entering and saying that uh, maybe if we see each other infrequently, we could preserve our uh, friendship, ending his beautiful speech with the statement, the land is forever pushing against the sea, and the sea is forever pushing against the land. It was Christopher Columbus a minor or a major player in the slave trade? Christopher Columbus was a, ma was a minor player in history and an over probably the most overrated personality in human history who discovered absolutely nothing. He couldn't get his scheme off the ground in Italy well, people wouldn't even pay any attention to him, and he would pawn this deal off on Isabella. When Isabella, uh, uh, this is just at the period now, uh, mm -hmm. when, when the Moors were being expelled from Spain. Now, there's a reason for Spanish colonialism being so sloppy. Even today, most Spanish-speaking countries, this is, a, this is a statement, anybody want to challenge me on the good challenge. Most Spanish-speaking countries today are sloppily run. The Spaniards came from under African colonialism one year and became colonialists later the same year. They had no rehearsal for power like England and some other countries. Mm -hmm. All right, but uh, the, the, the question I put, and maybe Professor Jeffries would want to address himself to that, uh, was Christopher Columbus a major player in the slave trade. Dr. Dr. Clark says he was a minor player in the broad sweep of history, but was he a major player in the slave trade? It's important for us to look at the role that Christopher Columbus initiated in this process. The relationship between the coast, west coast of Africa and Portugal had an involvement in terms of slavery. But the relationship across the Atlantic did not get started until later. Columbus 1492, that's one of those important dates in the 50 year turning point of history, with, with an accident was discovered on the beach in the islands of the Caribbean. In the wake of that discovery came the genocide of the Native American populations and the enslavement of the Africans. The relationship between Christopher Columbus and a Spanish cleric, Bartolomeu de las Casas, needs to be understood. Bartolomeu de las Casas documented the genocide of the Native American population in the wake of Columbus's discovery, and in that dynamic of dealing with the destruction of the Native American population, Bartolomeu de las Casas called for the church in Rome and the Spanish throne to end the oppression of the Native American by bringing over Africans, saving Indian souls by bringing over Africans who have no souls to save. And finally, in 1516, Bartolomeu de las Casas was successful with the Treaty of Testadelas and the Asiento of bringing over Africans to the Spanish New World, initiating that process. Columbus was crucial to it. He began the destruction of native population, which meant that eventually the dying out of the native population when the plantations were created, created the need for labor. The Europeans first tried their own people because they had this tradition of feudalism of working the land. Then they tried the Native American population who was being devastated by diseases and the cultural oppression that they were being uh, forced on, and this general destruction. And so the alternative after the Europeans failed to function in the Western world, after the Indians were devastated, was to bring over the African population. And so who made the suggestion? You're Christopher saying? Christopher Columbus made the suggestion to Father Bartholomew de las Casas, who had the authority to go to the Pope and ask for an increase in the African slave trade to offset the disappearance of Indian labor that wasn't functional for them in the first place. In a sweep of history. In the period before the establishment of the transatlantic slave trade, which the European nations were uh, heavily involved in, engineered, conceived, maintained, and sustained, in the years before, Europe was in chaos. Though that period of time I referred to as Europe being land poor, resource poor, people poor. The bubonic plague had wiped out a good part of the population in the 1300s, 1349-50. The chaos in the Catholic Church uh, was visible in the 1300s. There were two popes, one in Avignon in France, another in Rome. Mm -hmm. 
The Crusades had devastated Europe and the insanity of armies traveling across uh, the so-called Middle, to the Middle East to rescue Jerusalem. Europe was in chaos. In the sun belt around the world, there was a flowering. There was a golden age. There was a golden age along the west coast of Africa with those nations and civilizations referred to as Benin and Ife. There was a flowering in the Sudanic areas of the Niger River Belt where there were the successive empires of Ghana, Mali, and Sangai. In the New World, there was a flowering in the high Andes of the Inca peoples, and in Central America of the Mayans, uh, and the Aztecs later uh, are contributing uh, to that development. So there was this flowering. So we have to ask ourselves, what happened? My approach is that there was a 50-year turning point of history, 1482 to 1536. In that period of time, by accidents of history, the European was to be able to, was able to move from the wings of history onto center stage and push everybody else off. And what was Accidents the vehicle? Accidents of history. What was the vehicle? Those circumstances that came from a, Dr. Professor Clark talks about the icebox of Europe. The Europeans wanting to get to the wealth of the people of the sun. The tales of Marco Polo had fed into this. The uh, pilgrimage of Mensa Musa, the great African empire, emperor who went from his nation in Mali across North Africa onto Mecca, 1324-25. So this greed and this need for other people's wealth became real. But how could a people from a continent in decline overcome a continent that was in full flower? Well, you got to take into consideration who had the gun and who did not have the gun. In Europe's isolation, they had lost the concept of longitude and latitude. The Africans, Arabs, and the Berbers at the University of Salamanca in Spain had preserved the marit information on the maritime skill coming out of the great technical nation of that, na of that day, China. Once the European learned what to do with ships at sea again, he realized that he had to get outside of Europe to find some food. He's going, looking to Asia for the great spices, looking for something, the sweets and the spices, something to put on that all, gosh darn all for European food so he could eat it. <laughs> <coughs> he discovered Africa en route. They did not come to West Africa looking for slaves at first. They came looking for an ally. They had heard of an of a African king called Prester John, and he was supposedly a Christian king, and they were looking for an African Christian king to be an ally so they would fight the infidel Arabs who had blocked their trade in the Mediterranean. There is also the, the story that is thrown up that the African participated in the slave trade. Dr. Jeffries, what is your response to that? Is it so, and if so, what was the nature of that participation? Well, that... Uh question has come up to us often in our classes, for example. Didn't Africans participate in the slave trade? There was involvement of Africans in the slave trade, but the slave trade was an institution that was internationally planned, conceived in Europe, imposed upon Africa. You before asked the question of the technology. Professor Clark explained that the Europeans had the guns. They were on a war footing. They were constantly involved in war. The 1300s is is referred to as the first 100 years war between England and France. They talk about a 100 year struggle. European being on war footing when he came in contact with the Africans, his desire was for the wealth and he was scheming and plotting to take that. But as Professor Clark was saying, the first involvement along the coast of Africa, 1482, when the Portuguese built the fort at Elmina, was not for enslavement, it was for gold. And that's why we refer to that area as the Gold Coast. And for decades, that was the bulk of the trade, gold. But the Europeans also were involved in a struggle internationally with Islam. And as Professor John Clark was saying, that Prester John was the king in Ethiopia, and they were trying to get around Africa in order to get to Ethiopia. And they made allies as they went down the coast. And the how, African How did chiefs, they do that? How did they make allies? Well, the honorable trade was one. The trade, See, huh? uh, if we keep talking about this, we're going to arrive at a conclusion that the slave trade wasn't necessary. The European could have gotten more out of Africa through honorable trade, including labor. 
consistent with the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church to practice slavery? Is it not inconsistent with the teachings of the Muslim religion to engage in slavery? Oh, yes. Uh, Why and, not the Arabs? And, and Christianity Muslims? and Judaism. But all of them engage in it. The grandees in Spain but were predominantly Jews of Spain. The, those that sold the, 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 the Isabella pawned her jewelry too. They financed the slave boats. They were involved in the financing of the slave boat. Some of them went and, and, and crew. Some of the conquistadores were equally Hebrews. After the Jews had become a part of the system, especially when the, the Moors were chased out, the, the, and so in slave, carried off uh, to be slaves in the Caribbean, call, that, that started with a man called uh, Bartolomeu uh, Las Casas, the Roman Catholic uh, prior, uh, that, that said, after they done exterminated the, uh, most of the Indians, or so-called Indians, the Caribs, then he said, bring, bring us the Africans. Bring us those, especially in Spain, who refused to accept Christ. Imagine, Bartolomeu Las Casas speaking about accepting Christ. He forgot that Christianity started in Egypt with Pantheists and Botas, not in Rome. It had to start as inside of the Europeans' mind. And the kind of relationship the Europeans had with, with Africans before they developed this, con this whole concept that in some cases were very respectful in, in how and why the Europeans came down the coast of West Africa in the first place in as much as they did not come down the coast of West Africa originally looking for slaves. But many say that the Africans uh, engaged in slavery, they point that out very quickly that black Africans engaged in slave trading? Africans, we must distinguish between indentured servitude, where Africans enslaved their prisoners of war and freed them after a given time, where many of these same Africans, in concert with other Africans, rose to high position within the very family that supposedly enslaved them and some became kings in the very in the same family you cannot in any way compare this with the atlantic slave trade and another thing you need to remember except for the opening up of the new world and the wholesale murder of the indians the so-called indians that wouldn't have needed they wouldn't have needed any africans to come to the new world anyway, because they had an adequate labor supply, and they were looking basically for a labor supply. Now, no one could have engaged in anything as big as this without gun technology, and the gun technology was developed in Europe to protect Europeans from other Europeans. Then after the Africans lost Spain and control of the Mediterranean, the Europeans turned that gun technology on the Africans themselves. You need to know more than just slavery itself. We, we also need to look at the history of the Crusades that we think was about religion, that was really about politics and, and the Pope saving Europe from exploding within itself by letting them drain off the diseased pulse of their political sores on the lands of other people. If I could just go back a bit, though, uh, to the, the question of slavery, is it not true that Africans did participate in aid and abet Europeans who were enslaving Africans? Isn't that that not I'm not true? denying that, but I'm, I'm trying to show that this was not a major part, of, no matter what the Africans did. The Africans did not have the massive apparatus to transfer millions of people from Africa to the New World. And a lot of cases, the African became corrupt with the European bric-a-brac and wrong. But this is, these are exceptional cases instead of the general case. It's a myth in that sense that people are trying to say, and there's no justification, no records, that the African was involved in the initial enslavement of itself. Number one, when you take the dates, the Arab enslavement of the African came around 638 uh, of the Christian era, or 18 AH, 18 years of the, after the Harajira, mm -hmm. after Muhammad established Islam in the jihads, the holy wars. If someone can show me that an, an African state where slavery was practiced when those forces came, then I will accept it. Nobody who said that about the African can point to you of one African state 
One, a salutary one, where there was chattel slavery. Second, the slave trade of the, uh, by the European, which started with Pope Martin of the Roman Catholic Church, when he unleashed the Knights of Gen Genoa and the Knights of Malta and the African people, they, if they could show me an African state at that time, in 1501, 1506, that had slavery, chattel slavery, as what we're talking about, I will equally concede. Did not the Moors uh, carry out slavery in the southern Where? portion of Europe, in, in Spain? I mean, the Moors conquered Spain, but they never instituted chattel slavery. Enslavement that the Europeans imposed upon Africa had to do with a mentality of domination and property concepts that were institutionalized during feudalism in Europe and were transposed in that process as they began to develop the slave system in Africa. The slave system is a European phenomenon. Africans were seduced into it. Africans were forced into it. The first few decades, from 1482 until the Asiento, the contract to bring over Africans to the Spanish New World in 1516, was trading in gold, not trading in Africans. So once they got a foothold on the west coast of Africa and other places, they began to institutionalize another process, expanding from the enslavement of a trade in gold to enslavement. If you go to Ghana, where we've had a chance to go many times, a 200-mile stretch of the west coast of Africa and the nation of Ghana has 40 European forts and dungeons. Practically every European nation had a piece of Africa to blood suck. The Dutch, the French, the Brandenburg Germans, the English, the Danes, the Swedes had their emplacements in Africa, playing one African off against another, offering one African group guns and so that they, in their struggles, traditionally with another group, were able to dominate them. And this fed into this whole process. You cannot vic create the situation where the victims become the victimizers. The slave trade itself, um, these were British vessels and Spanish vessels, for the most part, and Portuguese vessels that were actually the slave ships. It depended upon which period of time you refer to as to which European nation dominated the trade, mm -hmm. but they all were involved. You're talking about the involvement of practically every European nation. You're talking about the involvement of every religious group, whether we're talking about the initiation of the process by the Catholic Church, the continuation of it when the Protestant Reformation took place, the participation by people of, of Jewish background. You're talking about everybody being involved in our degradation, Wait a minute and our humiliation. Wait you, you lifted up a scab here. You're saying that the, the church was involved in the slave trade or just sat by and said nothing? The church nothing? has taken responsibility. The Catholic Church, the Pope, John Paul II, who traveled the world around, has gone to Africa in the beginning of this decade, in the 80s, and apologized publicly to Africans for the church's involvement in initiating the slave trade and sustaining the slave trade and helping to maintain it. All of this is documented in Eric Williams' Capitalism and Slavery and a whole lot of other books. And, and uh, his updating of the documentation is in his last book, uh, uh, The Caribbeans from Columbus to Castro. I mean, we're not talking about something we have to mm -hmm. even search for. The evidence is so apparent. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I hear tell that, um, that ships that set sail had to be blessed. Is that so? And that that went uh, as well for slave ships? Practically every slave ship that left the ports of Europe was blessed by either a Roman Catholic priest or a Protestant mm -hmm. minister. And even the monstrosity of it all can be seen in the East Coast of Africa, where in Mombasa, one of the slave forts is called Fort Jesus. We all know about the ship, the good ship Jesus, that was one of the slavers making its way around the coast and across to the New World with our people captive in its hold. How is it conceived? How do a people can come upon the idea of enslaving another people? I agreed. It's, it, the enslavement doesn't come because you hate the people. You want their land. You want their natural resources. And in order to, to take them and control them, you must enslave them. Uh, by one means or the other. Uh, like the United States enslaved the Japanese for a little while until the, the Japanese was able to make a wingle a little and trade. When I conquer you, you are my slaves. I make you do what I want. Let's take apart 
racism and the way in which you use the word. Was this done because the Northern Europeans just don't like people of African descent, or were there political motives behind it, or economic motives? What do you really mean when you say racism? Well, I mean, I, it's a very complicated issue, and I think a certain amount of xenophobia, that is, dislike of other people, and especially other people who look very different, exists in many, if not most, societies in the world throughout history. Mm -hmm. But what happened in the 17th century in Northern Europe was something qualitatively different that racism became an obsession in Northern Europe, starting in Britain and France, but then spreading throughout Northern Europe. And the origin of that, I think, is pretty clearly uh, slavery. Uh, the uh, enslavement of millions of Africans and their maltreatment, and the need to justify that slavery by dehumanizing the victims. You couldn't behave so badly to men. You couldn't behave so badly to sons of Adam. Or, uh, uh, so you have to dehumanize the people you're behaving badly to. I think that's the essential. It's, it's a complicated and subtle thing, but that uh, is the core, the crux mm -hmm. of the issue. So because enslavement really had at its root economic motives as well, Oh yes. uh, so th there's a whole labyrinth of things that you really have to understand in order to really piece this thing together. Oh yes, and the involvement not only of societies, but particular individuals like uh, John Locke or David Hume, uh, philosophers who had a very major impact on the development of thinking in general uh, in England actually were paid, or particularly Locke, was employed by the Carolina Company, and which was very much involved in, in slavery. So you have, uh, you know, personal involvements, and a large number of the English upper middle class got their money through slavery. My, my family on two sides were involved in slaving. I mean, I can trace them back to the 18th century. I mean, it was a, a major part of the British economy. Throughout history, people have been involved in domination of one over another and various forms of servitude. But no people have devised a system of exploitation, super exploitation, where they denuded the human involved of his humanness and his spirituality. Only the Europeans have been able to create a system in which you became like the barn, like the mule, like the plow, chattel. And that comes because of his rooted system in feudalism for 1,000 years when he had that concept in his judicial system, in his economic, philosophical, and religious system for his own people. That becomes the tacit point that we need to really raise. What is the utility in bringing this up? Many say they're tired of hearing this whole issue about slavery. What is the utilitarian value? Because it's still with us in another form, only now it's computerized. And also we will be celebrating within a few years the monstrosity of Christopher Columbus's so-called discovery of the New World, which led to the genocide of the native population and the enslavement of the African population. Blindly, people in America, in this Western Hemisphere, will be celebrating this devastation of the human family, we of African descent, with our brothers and sisters who are Native Americans with those of the Latino background, who are a combination of the African and the Native American, we should be memorializing that devastation which took place, that holocaust of holocausts, the hundreds of millions that were affected. We should be memorializing that as a 500-year rededication to raising the spiritual nest that our people left as a legacy for the world, that within every human life form, within every natural life form, there is a spirituality, a oneness of God. That's the basic African value system. That's the basic Native American value system. We need to memorialize that process that was put in place to dehumanize us, but because of our spiritual strength, never did, and we have been able to rise as we have to continue to contribute to the human family. All right, on that note, we'll take one more break. And figures in the human rights struggle. It is impossible for history to be purely objective. It can never be purely objective. I think it can be more or less objective, that I think there are objective limits. But clearly, truth is socially conditioned to some extent. And there's this curious position of academia that it is in society, and yet it tries to transcend it at the same time. So it has both aspects. But I think for the last 150 years, ancient history has been overwhelmed by racism. I mean, racism was such a powerful and pervasive force that it was impossible for any part of society to escape from it. It, it, it was everywhere, every uh, bite of food and every breath you took.
it, it was there. And therefore, I think uh, all disciplines uh, were affected by it. Let's talk about the educational process uh, in specifics. Do you really, how, how would you tackle this, this re-educational process? Are we talking about, and I've asked it before on this program, uh, are you talking about peppering a white story with a little, little flex of anecdotes about black contributions? Or are you really turning the whole thing over and is that what you're advocating? We talk about the birth of Western civilization. Just, just mention, you, need to do a, you not, don't need a guest lecture, you don't need a book, just tell the children. And incidentally, these Egyptian beginnings, these were African. Greece, and, and Greece can, can be construed also as a non-white uh, culture. So you just, just drop it in. I'm going to push you a little bit, though, before we take a break, um, about this reconstruction of history a more painful aspect, i.e., George Washington, first president, general, founding father, was also a slave owner. Right. And Andrew Jackson made the Cherokees go on the Trail of Tears, and Columbus, all the Discovered national... he was lost. <laughs> and he did not discover America, but to go back to Washington and Jefferson, who also held slaves. The West was not won was stolen. That's that kind correct. of stuff. Okay. Now, very briefly, the way I see traditionally trained white people uh -huh. going through their changes is this. In phase one, you teach an all-white and womanless curriculum, and you don't notice that you have. Phase two, you put in a few famous others. You're still not facing you're not doing what you call lifting the scab. Right. You're just showing a few exceptional others, and you you study them as so-called role models, but you sort of neglect the fact that they were associated with many more like themselves. You see them, in fact, as exceptions to their kind, and therefore worth studying. That's, in a way, great. You may study Black History Month. I don't want to write it off, but it doesn't do the conceptual work that you're talking about, which involves the pain. Phase three, you get into issues of racism and sexism. And at that point, you learn about slaveholding founding fathers. At that point, you learn about how there was a wholeness of Indian communities here that ended when the so-called settlers, who were really the invaders, began to take over the land from people who never considered they owned land anyway. Um, we, we can't even conceive the differences. Um, now, phase three brings you into issues and ugliness and, and rape and pillage and violence and stealing and invasion and violation of all kinds. However, you may not agree with this, but I believe that if you stop there, what you've done is sort of play into the hands of those at the top, because you've conceded that they're top, and then there's this so-called bottom. So you've got a winners, losers, these won and these lost, and that perpetuates the view that whole groups of people have nothing but a deficit identity. That is, I, I name it a deficit identity. What I mean is you're teaching that they're the haves and the have-nots. And all the have-nots have is that they're not, that they don't have. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is damaging to the psyche of the children in the have-not groups, and it's also damaging to the children in school who are sitting there for coming off white male Anglo-European entitlement. It's uh, bad for both. Some might argue that this kind of information could really spell the collapse of many institutions as we know them on this planet or at least questioning and beginning to think about taking down or dismantling many systems and many nations in this country? Well, we have to pursue the truth where the truth will lead us. If the truth about the African foundation of the human experience cause us to look anew and make revisions and changes, then I think that's a benefit. For example, we are now in the midst of a frenzy around the Christopher Columbus phenomena. Billions are going to be spent raising up this white hero, Christopher Columbus. And this is typical of what we're talking about. The history that we've inherited from the European experience is what we call his story, the story of rich white men with property. Columbus is an, a perfect example. 
in 92, and in preparation for 92, there are going to be worldwide celebrations. But who was Columbus? As scholars, as teachers, as seekers of the truth, we have to deal with the reality of what Columbus really was and what he really wrought. For one thing, he didn't discover anything. He traveled across the ocean several times and he was lost, never knew where he was. He thought he was somewhere near Japan. And what was wrought by these so-called discoveries? The destruction of the Native American population because he immediately took back many of them for enslavement to Spain, in Spain, because he couldn't find the gold and riches that he was looking for. So the destruction of the Native American population, and after that, the destruction of the African population is what was wrought by Columbus. We have an obligation to raise that truth and expose this sordid lie, this monstrous lie. Others are committed to maintaining it, and there will be a conflict. But if the truth raised around Columbus can cause a dismantling of this farce, then I think we have an obligation to pursue that truth. Is it possible that the balance of power hangs in the offing here? That there may be a shift ultimately in the balance of power globally if there is a shift in information? I do not see why there should be such fears because that is something so far removed from the present moment. I see a movement to a different kind of human being possible as a result of interpenetration of cultures. I don't feel that you have to lose. You see, this is a fear on both sides. Some people fear you would lose your special Africanness or your special Jewishness or your special um, Europeanness because you embrace a plural culture. That is not so. You have a pride and a special connection to your family. That does not mean you ignore the world or that you cannot enter the world. A strong family enters the world with special advantages. Nations have been formed uh, on questionable terms. If those questions are raised, is it not possible that the balance of power in these nations that have been formed may change? You will get a new order. And where there are losses, there will be gains. The gain is a different human person. Mm. 